When we are dealing with chronic stress, cortisol is just flooding our system and creates a lot of problems. Now, how can those problems affect your health and well-being? And what can you do for cortisol not to hold your system hostage and for your adrenals not to find themselves burned out and fatigued? Well, for that, I have a great guest invited, Marcel Pick, who is a functional medicine practitioner, the author of several best-selling books, and she has been hosting a PBS special about me and the hormones that has been a viewer favorite for many years. So without further ado, I welcome Marcel to the show. Well, thank you, Marcel, for being on Empowerment Solutions. I'm really excited that you're here today. Thank you. I'm excited to actually talk about all these topics that we're going to delve into today. Well, so many of us are seeing stress mainly as a psychological issue, the emotions, maybe there's a lack of sleep, the thoughts, racing minds, but that is really also a physical issue. That's something we often overlook. So how does stress affect our body? You know, what's interesting is that we don't ever talk about it that way. You know, what we talk about is, you know, we'll decrease your stress and just breathe a little, go outside. And, you know, my response to that is if I knew how to do that, I would have done it 20 years ago. So the the reality is that um, we now know that we have two small glands on top of our kidneys called the adrenal glands, and they're the size of a walnut. Now, if you were 400 years ago and you had that kind of stress, you had a war coming or something like that, you would have had those adrenals kick in cortisol and you would have been able to, you know, not sleep through the night. You didn't need food and you had amazing energy, but then the war was over and you were either dead or life went back on and you partied. We don't do that anymore. The problem is that we feel like we're being chased by a tiger all the time and the consequences of that are extreme. So cortisol is very important. We can't live without it. You know, we have to have a little stress, which is good for us, but it's when we have enormous stress, like we're experiencing now from the the pandemic to um, everything on social media now to you see the news when it happens. We've got families, we've got parents, we've got children, we've got jobs, and it's almost too much for most people. And the consequence of that is that the body starts overproducing cortisol. Because we worry, we think, we we are anticipating, we're not sleeping properly anymore. And what happens then is that cortisol levels go up. And when cortisol levels go up, it has consequences. For example, if you have too much cortisol or even too little, which can come from too much stress for too long, you have the thyroids affected. So we have a thyroid that produces TSH, then it produces T. Uh, four, then that it produces T3. If you have too much cortisol, it blocks that. So it feels like the thyroid's not working properly. It affects the immune system. It increases autoimmune disorders. It causes unbelievable havoc with the hormones. And it blocks the hormone production. It causes enormous digestive issues. And what's amazing is that we don't ever talk about that with the physiological issues. And we also know significantly increases your risk of metastatic changes, perhaps even, you know, what we describe as cancer. Mm. So we have to do something about it, or even, you know, we can't change the stress necessarily, but we certainly can change how we respond to the stress. Now, when you say uh, we are now in a time where you're constantly chased by a tiger, so would you say that we are really in a society of chronically stressed people and that the problem is that our bodies just never had a chance to really adapt or relax enough to be healthy and, and well? Because, you know, studies show 70% of uh, visits at the doctor are now stress-related illnesses. So. Is this issue of stress-related illnesses really very much connected to the adrenals and all the aftermath? 
Absolutely. And here's the part. We, we have a beautifully laid out system. We have a parasympathetic nervous system and we have a, a sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic is when we're go, go, go. We can get a lot done in a day and us women, we multitask like crazy. Then we have the balance of that, the parasympathetic. And if you think about 400, 500 years ago, you know, we had, we, we really went with the rhythm of, of the planet. It was dark at night and we had candles, but that kind of makes you a little sleepy. Now we stay up until 12, one, two o'clock getting things done. And then the next day we start all over again. So the body never has that calm down time, that quieting time. And, you know, one of the other things that we're very, very aware of is, is something perhaps that you speak about, which is the ACE study, looking at adverse childhood events. And one of the things I tell my patients all the time is if you don't deal with your story, your story will deal with you. And one of the chapters in my book is your issues are in your tissues. So if we already, in addition to having life stresses on a day-to-day -day basis, we have significant issues from our own childhood. And I'm talking about parents that were screaming or parents that got divorced or you didn't feel loved. We know that that increases your health profile risks. You put that together with seeing social media, seeing bombs when they're, you know, when they're kind of landing in different parts, you see what's going on with the wars. It's enormous for people and they can't get away from it unless they learn and teach themselves how to get into the parasympathetic with either meditation or I'm a ballroom dancer, dancing or, you know, yoga or something that gets you out of that thinking mode so we can calm that nervous system down. Now, now we're all scared because obviously everything that you mentioned is a part of our story. But uh, I think what's so interesting about the adrenal fatigue uh, that many people say, well, the adrenals are tired. But what you just said is actually that the adrenals are overproducing cortisol with all its effect. Why is it called adrenal fatigue? Because what goes up, what goes up must come down. So sometimes mm -hmm. too much cortisol causes, there's different levels for, for issues around adrenals. So we have those people that are tired and wired, but their numbers are up all the time. Then we have people that I kind of call the, you know, the workhorse, they're up and down throughout the day. And then we have people that are what I call flatlined. They're very, very low. And that adrenal issue has been going on for a long time. And what we know is we can use supplementation, which is fantastic. We have adaptogenic herbs that can help a great deal. But if we don't deal with what caused that stress to begin with, then it comes back. I mean, I would see people in my office over and over and over again because they didn't deal with whatever that issue was, perhaps perfectionism, per perhaps, you know, um, working too much because there is some pain you don't want to deal with. You know, in uh, there was an article in the New York Times a few years ago looking at the normal work week of 80 hours a week is normal. Part time is 40 hours. Well, we can't do that. We're not meant to do that. And I doubt any of us when we're dying at 120 are going to say, I wish I'd worked more. It's more than likely I wish I'd played more. So it's how do we find that balance in our lives to get ourselves into that calming part of ourselves, that parasympathetic on a daily basis, not just once a week when we go to yoga class. It's every day. And we're all different. We all have different mechanisms. For me, you know, when I'm dancing, I cannot think of anything else because I'll trip or my partner will trip. But what is it for you? You know, what is it for the audience that helps them feel that calming? For some women, it's, it's doing crafts. Or it's, you know, it's, it's getting out of yourself and going outside in nature. Whatever it is, that needs to be done every day. Now, the problem for many is not only that there is this always an excuse, well, right now I just don't have time for this or I'm just too busy and maybe next year. But then there is also this pushing energy of the cortisol that keeps you awake at night, that makes your thoughts more about problem solving, how can I protect myself, what else does need to get done. So isn't it true that we have to really also get that out of the way? And this is something that I often find as a missing link. So many people do try to do the right things, but then as soon as they sit on the pillow and try to meditate, their mind is racing. As soon as they want to go earlier to bed, they know they're going to lay awake until three o'clock in the morning because they don't come to rest. And this can all be connected to the adrenal. So 
what can we do to help our adrenals? You mentioned herbs, and there is certainly also nutritional things that we can add. Oh, can talk a little bit about that. So the, the wonderful news is if you have high cortisol levels, and it is an area in which I recommend people actually get tested because I've been surprised when I thought they were up and down and they were really high or when I thought that mm. they were going to be really low or, or vice versa. So it's helpful to get that test and it's usually done in a, a, a saliva test. And when you have that information, we see that the cortisol is high at night. There's an herb called phosphatidylserine that can be extremely helpful to get that cortisol down so that you can really start to breathe again and not have that cortisol be racing. Um, it's also helpful to do thymus tapping. You can do tapping on the thymus gland and also even 777 breathing. You inhale mm. for seven, you hold for seven, you exhale for seven, seven times, just twice a day. That can also help get into the parasympathetic. There's all kinds of, you know, things that you can use with your smartphone now. There's apps, you know, called Calm. There's um, many different apps that they've had out for a long time that will really help you learn how to get into that parasympathetic state. There's other herbs that can be very helpful, adaptogenic cordyceps, rhodiola, ashwagandha, that can be used again to help to uh, mitigate. And then dietary changes, avoiding sugar, unfortunately. I know people love it, but it doesn't do much for our biochemistry. And keeping the carbohydrates down and doing protein, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, perhaps even some snacks, because glucose levels get very, very um, um, dysregulated when the adrenals are, are abnormal. So there's huge physiological factors that go on when we have this stress. And for years, what we said is, oh, just decrease your stress. And it's like, no, really pay attention because it does have major physiological ramifications. So what about vitamins and minerals? Do they also yeah. play a role? They do. I mean, the, the interesting part is if you have high cortisol production and you're not eating a really balanced diet, then we're nutrient deficient. And, and the sad part is that our food stores are, um, are, or our food, the way it's produced now is not what it used to be 200, 400 years ago. So many of the nutrients are not present in some of the food choices that we're making. And so I tell people to shop around the aisles of the store, not the middle aisles. And if a food, you know, stays on your counter and it's still good in two weeks, I probably wouldn't have it, um, but really have fresh food as much as you possibly can, organic as much as possible. There's the environmental working group that looks at what's the clean 15, the foods that you don't have to get organically, and what's the dirty 12 that you really need to pay attention to because they spray them and you would consume that. Mm. We also know that there's, you know, incredible burden now with Lyme disease and some of the other, you know, Epstein-Barr that can contribute and even mold to having adrenal dysfunction as well. So we have to look with somebody that practices functional medicine, which is what I do, looking at the cause of the cause to understand what's going on. And when we put the puzzle together, yes, we add nutrients, but we look to see what nutrients you might be deficient in. And we make dietary changes. And we also, I oftentimes will recommend no gluten and no dairy because so many people are reactive to those. And gluten can certainly be a thing that really drains the adrenals as well. So it's looking at a whole composite and people can absolutely get better. So yes, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm scared in what you're saying. But the great news is we can change it. You know, it, it is something that's changeable. And I don't want people to be scared. I want them to be aware and kind of go, ah, I never thought of it that way. And now what can I do about it? Well, the way I understand you, it's also the small changes we can make. It doesn't have to be something that uh, is one amazing solution that we take. It's more like about lifestyle changes, taking some breaks, some nutritional changes. All of those things are basically about a more balanced lifestyle. But what I'm wondering is, you know, when, for example, other stressors happening like menopause, a lot of women are really struggling when the hormones are changing and that can also have an effect, progesterone, menopause uh, and uh, progesterone uh, deficit, deficiency and menopause and adrenal uh, fatigue. How does that all connect to each other? Yeah, great question. So we know we've heard the term cholesterol 
Well, our cholesterol actually makes estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and DHA, as well as the ovaries. If you have too much stress, the body has an enzyme called 1720 lyase, fancy name. It blocks the production of those hormones so that we can make more cortisol. So the first hormone that goes down is progesterone. And what we see in general in perimenopause is that people have more estrogen in relation to progesterone. And some of the symptoms might be they can't sleep at night. They feel more irritable. They feel more cranky. They might even have some depression and they might have more hot flashes because the estrogen level is going up and down. And now more than ever, what I'm seeing for women in perimenopause, I used to see hot flashes and night sweats. I don't see that as much anymore. I see anxiety as being one of the huge things that people present themselves with. That executive that would be driving from my area to Boston all the time, and she can't even imagine driving herself anymore. Mm. And those are all the things. That, and the thing that I see about perimenopause also is that menopause is a journey of self-discovery. Who am I? What am I going to do for the second half of my life and how do I get there? And that's really about then looking at how do I evaluate my life differently? It's adolescence in reverse. And what are the things that I need to do differently, perhaps in my life and also my diet? That's when we can't get away with as much because estrogen is an anti-inflammatory hormone. So we don't, you know, it's better to, to change the diet, to have less carbohydrates, to have more balanced. And we're all different. Some people need low carb, some people need Mediterranean, some people need more balance, some people need low fat, believe it or not. But it's finding out what works best for you so that you can have a food plan that really speaks to your own biochemistry. Do you believe we need to learn to listen to our bodies more because our bodies are communicating with us all the time, not only when they put out the hammer and say, hey, I have pain or here is a real inflammation happening, but there are more subtle messages. And what subtle messages especially with the adrenals, should we pay attention to? Well, if you're needing four cups of coffee in the morning to wake up, if you wake up exhausted, if you feel wired and you feel that sense of you know anxiety because it feels like you've got two cups of coffee and you haven't or three, um, notice how your body you know feels when you wake up in the morning. Do you have body aches? Do you mm. have brain fog? You know, are you someone who feels more depressed? Are you someone who quickly goes to that place of, you know, beggars, if anything bad's going to happen, it's going to happen to me. So it's just noticing those things because those are all things that can actually change. And I refer a lot of my patients to Joe Dispenza and mm -hmm. some of the meditation work that he does. And I've seen miraculous changes in humans when they really kind of understand some of, you know, if I don't deal with my story, my story will deal with you and they reframe it. And they look at it in a different way. You know, the notion of how we wake up in the morning emotionally predicts the rest of the day for us. We can change that at any point. We can focus on a different memory. We can focus on a different emotion. And that can change our physiology in a heartbeat. But isn't it interesting that we are often so, I would say, addicted almost to stress. We are so attached to being a certain way and that we almost lose our identity if we are not that person anymore. So what do you recommend to your patients when they are just stress monkeys and they feel like I can never be really that relaxed because I don't, I'm not productive anymore. I cannot get my job done. People will just, you know, waltz over me. What are you telling people about that? You know, it's interesting. If we look at the studies, what we find is that people that find ways to have that balance are actually more productive. And then when we're spinning our wheels and we're worried, and what I do see is people oftentimes use work when they don't want to feel their feelings. And especially in America, you know, I wasn't born here and my family is not from, from America. My mom was Dutch and my dad Hungarian. You know, it's very, very um, imbued in us here that who you are is about what you do in the world. Now that's more, I'm finding more of an older generation issue. It's not such an issue for the younger, but for the women that are in menopause now, it's definitely an issue, you know, okay. So now I'm in menopause and you know, what's left for me. And it's really looking at how do I become the most amazing person that I can actually be? Because we know now scientifically that we can live well into our nineties and be healthy. 
but a lot of that will also come from what our internal, you know, vocabulary is to ourselves and what our belief system is kind of in terms of what we're, what's possible for us. And that, especially what you just said, the belief systems, when it comes to that, I see this often in my clients, these limiting beliefs. And certainly it is a limiting belief that you're only identified by the career that you have, the money that you're making, whatever you do for your community, all wonderful things. But unfortunately, often we end at the bottom of the totem pole and we are not really taking care of ourselves. And, and that certainly, you know, doesn't help when we are told we are selfish when we are just doing a little self-care. So those things fundamentally probably have to share uh, to, to change not when we are dealing with, you know, a serious health issue, but before that we really start now. Now, one of the things I'm wondering, and I have to say, I'm a little biased about that, but uh, a lot of people feel like healthcare for them, especially mental, emotional healthcare is also smoking or taking cannabis. What do you see as the health benefits or the health challenges with that? Great question. You know, I think that there's a time and a place for everything. And we know from some of the scientific research that cannabis actually does help people get into parasympathetic. So we have a problem there. Because if people don't know how to do it any other way, they may be more inclined to do it on a regular basis. So for me, anything that gets us away from ourselves can be a problem when it's used all the time. Learning how to be with yourself, learning how to understand these pieces, I think is more important than ever. I mean, if you look at the book and uh, zebras don't get ulcers, you know, years, years ago that was written and it looked at the whole notion that when zebras are in the field and they get chased by a lion, if they're not eaten, they go back to that field and they're, you know, eating their grass again. We humans think about, oh my gosh, I almost got, you know, eaten by a, a, a lion and oh my God, I can't imagine how I'm ever going to go back to normal and, and on and on and on. And that's what increases the stress. So it's really finding, finding ourselves in many ways and finding the balance of who we are, you know, what is really important to us and not be so driven by either money or our career, or, you know, we have balance in our lives. We have children. The problem for so many women is women multitask and they can get a lot done in a day, but at what expense, you know, that's, that's the crucial issue. And what I say to my patients is, look, your children are going to learn from what you do, not what you say. So they're going to notice that you're working really hard, that you're, you know, going here, you're going there, you don't have time and you get a little bit, you know, more angry and things because you're trying to do so much at the same time. It's not good either. Do you know? So it's, it's, and it's a work in progress, you know, and you, as you said, it's baby steps. Maybe this week I won't have any sugar or this week I'll do seven, seven, seven breathing, or I'll take a dance lesson or, uh, you know, something like that. So it's really figuring out for yourself in baby steps, not, not enormous, but becoming self-aware is the big piece. And making really brave choices. And, and I think that's why I'm so biased about, you know, any kind of substance use, because yes, it can help you to in the moment have a fast way to relaxation, but it doesn't change your patterns and it doesn't help you necessarily to change how you think, because if you feel like what always drives you is worrying or insecurity, and then you feel with a smoke of some nice little joint, you don't have those issues. Well, guess what? They're going to show up the next day because you don't really deal with them. And that's what I find in general. We probably have to do more, deal with ourselves, take ourselves more serious, be more curious about what's possible. Because I always find like you as a functional medicine uh, practitioner, you know the body is designed to heal and grow and evolve. And we just don't necessarily believe it or take enough advantage of it, or we don't support it enough. And that's certainly something that you are really all about. Hands down. Um, what's interesting, though, if you look at medicine now, medicine is about a diagnosis and a medication. And a lot of times we need to spend more time with people to see and understand what's really going on behind that 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 curtain. So it's it's really learning that part to the puzzle. And it takes longer than seven minutes to do that. Well, that's exactly so why I left medicine. <laughs> exactly. Because uh, unfortunately, I don't know exactly uh, if this will ever change, I hope so. But uh, 
that that no time for a person and trying to get them quickly in a box as soon as possible of feed them something like a pill that supposedly you know takes care of the symptoms and then send them off their way that's not really health care this is more like emergency care but that's not really making a person healthy Absolutely. I mean, and I teach for the Institute of Functional Medicine, and we train 700 doctors and practitioners five times a year. I just was, uh, I taught with them in the UK. And, you know, so it is the word is getting out and many more people are wanting to find somebody in functional medicine that can really help them get to the root cause of what the problems are. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it's all about is, you know, what, what are all the pieces to the puzzle? What's happening to your endocrine system, to your cardiovascular system, to your, you know, gynecological, you know, we don't need all these different people. We need somebody that's going to help put the pieces together for someone. And people are wanting that. They just don't know oftentimes where to go. And uh, the adrenal stress has created enormous havoc for people, um, especially over the last several years with the pandemic. Now, let's say you are just hearing all of this and you say, OK, where do I start? I don't know. I cannot go to a functional medicine uh, practitioner because there is no one. I don't know how to get a cortisol test. So I was just want to start somewhere. Is there like three simple steps that you could say this is what can already make a difference and you could see if you're on the right track? Well, I, I, I want to start by saying also that so much is online now. So if you're at all adept with a computer, I mean, I've got a very, very robust website and I have lots of articles about adrenals on there. It's marcelpig.com. I wrote a book on adrenals. Is it me or my adrenals? The great news is you can just look at all this information and see who resonates the most with you. I wouldn't suggest going to lots of different places because then you get confused. And then perhaps stopping sugar or doing seven, seven breathing every day, or getting, you know, uh, one of the apps for your phone so you can listen to Calm every day. Those are things that you can do. And there's so many computers now that you can actually, or computer systems, you can actually plug into what's your heart rate variability, you know? Um, and there's companies called HeartMath that have many, many things available to us. And that, that wasn't true 25 years ago. So we have so much that we can do and so much we can change. And I think the thing that really brings it home to me the most is changing our belief systems, looking at what our patterns of behavior, you know, for example, that person that says, if anything bad's going to happen, it's always going to happen to me. They've had that happen so often that the, you know, the pathways in their brain are, are just that. And then we have to change that neuroplasticity to say, no, I'm not going to think that anymore. I'm going to change my thought. And gratitude, just looking at all the things, we know that there are actual changes that happen physiologically for us. When we go to, I have an amazing house, I have great view out my yard, you know, into my yard. I see deer in my gardens all the time, you know, whatever it is, that is, that happens to be my house, but you know, whatever it is for you that brings you joy, that needs to be something we spend more time on than the worry, the worry, the worry, the worry. Worry does nothing for us. It doesn't change an outcome. It only changes our body chemistry. You know, maybe worrying for half an hour a day. That's fine. But not, you know, every day, all day, all night. It just, it's not helpful. So stress less, worry less, and be more grateful and focus on the things that really bring you joy, that bring you closer to each other that are filled with love and practice your parasympathetic nervous system, strengthen it just by relaxing and not by running around and trying to make everyone happy, but yourself. I have one last question. I know we just almost yeah. finished, but I had one last question. When someone wants to take an herb, let's say they find these ashwagandha or something, do you recommend to take it longer term or just 10 days or how long do you recommend? You well, take? that's where it comes into being really helpful to know what your numbers look like. You know, where, what are you trying to treat and um, getting a book and maybe taking some quizzes to figure that out for yourself. I mean, ashwagandha and uh, you know, rhodiola and cordyceps are really oftentimes in combination as well, just to support the system. But you have to make the lifestyle changes. Yes. Otherwise, you're just taking it like a drug and expecting it to get you better and it won't. 100%. Change your beliefs, change your thoughts, and 
take good care of yourself. Well, thank you, Marcel, and I wish you Welcome. all the very best. Thank you for all the work. You already mentioned your website, but maybe you can do it one more time. Sure, it's marcelpick.com. I have lots of it. 1400 articles there on everything you can imagine. And then the book I wrote is, is it me and my uh, adrenals and that you can get on Amazon as well. And you have other books too. I do. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Hi, Dr. Friedman here. Thank you for tuning into my YouTube channel. If you're interested in learning more about fear and anxiety, here you'll find guided meditations, webinars, and interviews with some of the most renowned experts in the field of empowerment. Delve into the over 230 videos and more to come every week.